Uh, and we're starting off our afternoon session with a super special speaker. Um, here we have Juan Benet, founder and CEO of Protocol Labs, uh, a long time a pioneer in decentralized storage and the inventor of IPFS and Filecoin. We give a huge round of applause for Juan. Thank you, Thank you so much. Also a generally okay. awesome human. Can we get my thing off my mask? Yeah, you can great. Uh, hey everyone, uh, really excited to be here uh, with you. I um, have a few things to go through. Um, what I want to talk about today is public data commons. Uh, think of be, think of how much society uses different kinds of data sets and di different kinds of computing infrastructure to store really precious, valuable data. Not just your personal private data, but the data that we as a community uh, use together to um, govern our lives, to um, uh, form organizations, to form governments, to decide what, what we want to do. Um, so the, the advent of uh, crypto enables, uh, gives us the mechanisms to build public data commons that enable um, a new kind of structure that hasn't really been possible in the internet before. So I want to kind of get to motivate why that matters um, and kind of describe how we're going to build these things. Uh, so uh, Filecoin is a crypto powered storage network. The mission of Filecoin is to create a decentralized, efficient, and robust foundation for humanity's information. There's a lot uh, embedded in that, in that statement. Uh, what I want to kind of focus on today is um, the kind of foundation for humanity's information part. Uh, and so I'll dive deeper into that. And so kind of the, the thing I wanted, want you to picture is just you know, that library off to, the, to the, my left. Um, think of like, uh, storing all of the world's knowledge uh, and making it publicly accessible uh, to all. Uh, I don't have to convince you of this. I think you all, you're living it. Uh, the, the changes in computing wave after wave for the last 80 years have totally transformed their species. Um, a human today is vastly more powerful uh, than a human 80 years ago. And this, these kinds of changes are um, transforming our species. Uh, today we are this uh, highly interconnected uh, sort of like meta-organism that uh, together billions of humans uh, mediated by trillions of computing devices uh, interact in all kinds of ways. Uh, and all of this is sort of mediated by different applications and services that are writing on our computing um, application platforms. Now today, the main application platform um, is the web. Uh, so the web sort of writes on the internet. Uh, the mobile web and the mobile app sort of like are bolted onto the side. Uh, but the major thing that powers how we, how we interact is the web platform, the ability to form just basic documents that then you can upgrade into an application and push through um, the broader internet and make them accessible to, to everyone in the world. And what's been really amazing over the last 30 years now, can't believe it's been that long, um, is that any group of people can get together, um, discuss some, some problem, dream up an idea, spend some amount of time and some amount of, of um, resources in acquiring computers, learning how to program, building a thing and shipping out to the world, to now grant a superpower, a highly scalable superpower to the rest of the world. Um, now, of course, the world here is the connected world. Of course, um, tons of people around the world uh, don't have connectivity. That's a um, separate and, and super critical problem. Um, but part of what's made the web this amazing environment that has given us so much is that it, it is this permissionless, free innovation medium where small groups of people um, can get together, dream up an idea, code up a superpower, and deliver it to the world. And as you um, tap into that superpower, you can dream up other ideas and get together with other people, uh, make your own version, and, and ship it out to the world. And so that has been uh, you know, one of the things under uh, the undercurrent of the amazing growth that the world has seen over the last 30 years. Um, now, there's a bunch of different changes coming um, in the horizons of computing. So, so if you start looking not just to the past, but look ahead, many different kind of interfaces are, are coming into, um, into our society. Everything from augmented reality, virtual reality, brain-computer interfaces, AI systems, eventually AGI. And all of these are going to be mediated and run through the same kind of application platforms uh, that we use and build today. Um, if those application platforms can be good enough for these interfaces. Now, all of these things are going to change our lives dramatically more than the internet has already. Uh, and when those arrive, it's really critical that the properties of the computing platform 
have our best, um, uh, our best benefits in mind, right? So the creators of these things uh, should be aiming for the broadest, uh, most beneficial kind of outcomes uh, that we can aim for. And a lot of that often depends on the properties on the internet underneath the hood. So whether the internet makes it easy for two parties to connect or small groups to connect, whether um, that internet is robust um, and, uh, or whether it's brittle and you know, one single party could uh, cut off access to a whole community or whether you know, an invading country can like, shut down your internet and prevent you from coordinating with your family and finding each other to like, escape uh, or to fight back. So all of those kinds of properties that are fundamental to the protocols that our devices run are ultimately what where, are where, um, playing huge roles in how um, humanity interacts. So this is why it really matters that the infrastructure, the, un the, the infrastructure that we run, does not depend on centralized parties. That does not depend on groups that can be, that can decide to disconnect people, or can decide to impose their values on others, or that can be coerced to do so. Oftentimes, this is not like it's not like a centralized provider is a bad actor. It's just they're rational and they're coerced by other parties. Uh, so as you kind of consider the impact of computing. Um, in the past and the future, just think of the properties that you want the internet to have. Think of the, um, s the key characteristics that you want to imbue the underlying network now um, before all of these other interfaces come into our lives and change our lives uh, dramatically more. So already, um, the benefits of a decentralization are, are huge. Um, when these interfaces start arriving, it'll be even more important that, that we bake in rights into, into the network. Uh, so this is kind of where, where Web3 fits in. It, it, lets us, it gives us the primitives and components to be able to imbue the network um, with uh, verifiability layers and economic incentive layers that allow us to create some guarantees about the operation of the system. Uh, and so you, know, you can think of a whole bunch of different values that Web3 might be aiming for. Um, these are just some that I threw together a few years ago. Um, I'm sure that other people have their own lists. Um, each of these things sort of maps onto sets of protocols or set of properties that you might want to have in, in the system. So you know, think of um, freedom of speech or freedom of assembly mean that you need um, uh, computing systems that allow you to connect to a, uh, each other, that allow you to publish information that is broadly accessible. Um, you know, reader and writer privacy means that the network shouldn't be able to track the people that publish information or that read certain kinds of information. So as you kind of, um, all of these, these properties or all of these values, we would like to bake into the underlying protocols. So um, let's kind of like shift gear. So hopefully I've kind of um, impressed upon you how important it is to bake in, bake in rights into, into the network layer. Now, I want to kind of drill in and focus on um, kind of the users own and control their data piece, um, because that's, I think, where um, the crypto primitives that we have today enable um, a whole set of uh, characteristics that haven't really been seen before. Uh, and so this is where the data commons perspective com comes in. Uh, so now I want you to sort of, uh, maybe I'll use this slide again, this one. So try, I'd like you to imagine some um, uh, really precious uh, set of information that you really care about. It could be a set of books, it could be um, some maps, it could be um, we, things like Wikipedia or encyclopedias, it could be um, learning materials uh, to propagate knowledge, it could be the infrastructure layout of your city, um, it could be the real-time uh, data showing the public transportation lines, um, it could be um, the kind of like weather conditions around the planet in any one given moment um, so that you can track like pollution or you can track um, uh, certain, whether or not certain parties are, are adhering to uh, commitments made to uh, be more sustainable and so on. So there's all these really critical data sets. And today, most of those data sets end up in some centralized provider where a sp specific uh, company is making some specific guarantees about that data. And um, this is a brittle um, structure for societies to build their platforms on. Um, societies and governments and so on um, need uh, ways of interacting, ways of um, uh, governing their data sets uh, in a way that uh, can be directly with the community as opposed to having to go through some intermediary and only uh, through the interfaces that that intermediary provides. Uh, so ideally, we would, we would like to create a structure that much like we can create uh, land commons and you know, think of um, uh, the, the whole idea of like, creating commons comes from 
um, being able to use land together as a society, being able to kind of um, think of like pastures and fisheries and uh, roads or um, all kinds of, kinds of these common use uh, structures, um, we're now going to be able to create these kinds of things uh, on the internet. Um, and today, uh, there's been a lot of groups that have tried to create these digital commons, but ultimately they're sort of hampered by um, the structure of the internet today and the structure of the web. Uh, the web today forces you to be a specific authority, a specific identity, uh, publishing data in the network. You can't form a collective, um, you can't form a community that together is going to govern the data uh, without sort of hooking into some kind of human organization already embedded in a nation state uh, or that has a bank account somewhere. And like that's what we can uh, rebase. Like we can build now structures that do not require you to have some um, uh, entity in a nation state or some bank account that can shut down um, access or that can intermediate and decide um, how your transactions should work. So, so this is like what's going to enable us to form uh, communities and collectives and data commons um, directly on the, on the network. So um, maybe I'll describe like how we might get to that. So you know, you think of many different kinds of data sets that you might want to gather. Um, so, so the key thing that enables us to do this is that at the end of the day, a commons or a, a system of um, participants coming together to transact together around a, a shared resource um, needs some structure, some mechanisms that govern those commons, especially if you want to avoid things like the tragedy of the commons, which is a you know, classic problem when groups uh, get together and try to uh, govern a resource. Um, but this is where mechanism design uh, comes in. This is why crypto enables us to do this. It lets us encode the rules of, uh, and the behaviors, the participation rights, the uh, governance rights, the governance responsibilities of various parties directly into the structure of the commons itself, and you can kind of instantiate those, those systems uh, directly on the network. Um, a lot of what I'm describing is like just starting to appear, so you can think of all the DAOs as like the first versions of that. Um, what's coming ahead is a thing uh, a lot of us in the Falcon community are calling data DAOs, uh, group decentralized autonomous organizations that are going to govern some um, shared resource, some shared um, data sets, and are going to decide how different parties use that data, um, how they, um, what rights various different parties have, rights to access, rights to view, in what conditions, where, uh, all of those kinds of things can be encoded into the infrastructure, into the layers of the internet that um, enable parties to, to transact. And, and that way communities can decide, can, can form the, the, that commons, decide how it should be governed, and then enable free and open participation by anybody within those specified rules. And they don't have to kind of continue running it or be responsible or be capable of being coerced uh, to change the rules, which is really a, a, a very fundamental piece here. Uh, so I wanna kind of show some macro trends just so that we kind of um, understand what kind of data might wanna uh, be part of this at the beginning. So this is kind of like, um, just so that we have in mind what these sort of things, what these interfaces and software and tools um, have to target. So this is you know, a trend of you know, the, the connections in the world. So um, that green uh, slice that is way bigger than PCs, tablets, and so on is smartphones. Most of the internet today is accessed through, through these you know, pocket supercomputers. And it's really critical that all our products and interfaces and so on are accessible to these things. So right now, a lot of the crypto world is not that accessible to these things. So this enabling access through uh, phones really, really matters. That big blue thing at the bottom that is like, creeping up and it's gonna swallow everything um, you know, in terms of proportion is a thing called machine to machine, which means this is kind of large scale infrastructure, um, IoT um, factories and so on, all of that stuff is coming online and getting um, automated that's what the traffic represents. This also represents, I think, data center to data center traffic, so it might be sort of cheating. There's might, there might be a lot of consumer-oriented things um, embedded in there, but still kind of most of the internet traffic is computers acting on our behalf to prepare things for us. Um, here is uh, kind of uh, slicing down, taking a different slice more, more at what consumers uh, do. This is like the, the share of internet traffic, so um, some amount is web and data. Um, but the vast amount is video. So the, in the last 20 years, uh, the you know, sort of humanity has uh, used these systems to now push tons of video through the network. Um, now, in practice, like the actual page views and so on might be more in other kinds of information. Like if you think of your day-to-day, -day, you probably consume way more um, direct uh, like text and so on. Um, 
but video is like a huge part of like the large data and and the traffic over the internet. And more and more, um, what's been kind of very surprising about the um, the Ukraine war right now is uh, so much of the news coming out is video. It's like individual people uh, recording what's going on and pushing it to often Twitter or TikTok, and those are like the <laughs> the main ways that like things are getting out, uh, which is kind of crazy. Like uh, you can sort of see TikTok front running like major uh, news outlets, um, and it's uh, kind of crazy. And and now key point there is like we need to be able to discern what's true and what's not true. We need to be able to discern um, uh, how things are presented and so on. And so it's you know, important to build community systems around all of this data that's getting generated uh, to be able to kind of distill it and reason about it better and so on. And so they, the kind of centralized platforms, especially centralized social networks, don't really let you do that. Um, they want sort of like this very direct connection from creator to publisher. And that data stream, you can't really tap into it and comment on it. Um, you can sort of like grab that data and refer to it and say, hey, actually, this thing um, is bi super biased in this, these ways, or hey, actually, this thing is like proved to be fake, or hey, this video was like a totally different conflict that just like got slapped in. Um, and it would be really amazing to build, be able to build applications that can layer on top of the data um, to provide those different kinds of views. And today, that can't work because of how the infrastructure works. Because we um, put all of our data within a single centralized provider, that centralized provider owns the, the connection directly to the consumer and makes it really impossible to build those kinds of applications. But if we build a data commons layer where the data can be um, addressed independently of those, those developers, you can address it by hash and so on, um, then you can start doing, building those kinds of applications and those kinds of systems because you can gather data together and provide them different interfaces to view it. Um, yeah, here's another, you know, video is massive. Like if, if, uh, uh, if you're not working on like, um, improving the situation, um, uh, definitely consider it. Uh, so, yeah, let me uh, now go, to, go on to data sets and I'll sort of finish quickly. So, w one really important piece of the whole puzzle is that once you gather data, you want to be able to compute on it. So you want to be able to run computation around that data. And so one of, one of the key things that's going to appear with these data DAOs and these data communities uh, is that they're going to govern how you should compute on, it, compute on it, what kind of access you should get. And this can help solve a bunch of the problems that are out there right now in terms of uh, fair use of information or um, ethical ways of, of computing on, um, on social data, ethical ways of computing on private data, and so on. Uh, being able to kind of layer in specific um, kind of rights around the data when the competition is coming in, I think, is, is, is really critical. So imagine kind of a data DAO leveraging these decentralized clouds and defining how those functions that want to run over your data um, uh, should operate. Uh, one, one other important piece here is data has gravity. Data is really big and heavy. Once you start getting into petabytes and exabytes and so on, it's really difficult to move it. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people in this room know just how difficult it is to move a lot of data. Um, so we're, we're going to be moving the computation close to the data. So think of um, source providers and so on expanding to have um, GPUs and other ways of running computations around the data. And so now, you know, think back to your, those data sets that, that, that I asked you to think about at the very beginning. Um, maybe I'll like, flash a few different kinds of things. Maybe it'll um, hit what you were thinking about. Um, and just as we together build up all of these um, different systems and different applications and different uh, services that we want to, all these superpowers that we're creating, um, think of imbuing that critical data set that you really care about um, with shared rights and think of the community that should govern that data um, uh, together. And then now like, let's, let's kind of like break down what a, how to construct the data now. Um, so at the, at the, the main components of a data DAO are just one, one piece, which is the ability to make decisions as a group, which already exists. These are the DAO smart contracts, um, the ability to kind of tie an identity with some participation rights over a shared resource. Uh, so great, we have like that component done. And the next thing is that you need to associate that DAO with an uh, updatable data set. So you need a form of a collection that can be stored on chain, that can reference some, data, some updating data set, and can decide who gets to update that data or who gets to validate that some item is within that data set and can track over time the long-term um, maintenance of that data, so making sure that that data can be preserved um, and can decide on the access rights of participants trying to use that data. So kind of like think of a model, um, model like this where, where um, over time you kind of have these 
DAOs that are associated with um, some set of data structures directly on chain that can describe the, the, the set of rights that people can have over the data um, and can govern the collection that, that you maintain. So I think a lot of that tooling is missing. So that's kind of the opportunity here to make data DAOs uh, work. Um, and I think um, there's a number of people working on this. Uh, if you find, um, yeah, I, I don't know what's private or public, so I don't know whether, whether to mention or not. But there's, there's a number, number of people in the community working on data DAOs. Um, and this is one of the things that I'm most excited about in the uh, whole Falcon space, because these things are going to start emerging and start collecting many different kinds of data sets, gathering the community around those data sets to help curate it and help maintain it over time. Uh, one other crazy thing that I'll kind of like throw in there um, is that because of how the Filecoin crypto economy works, um, it is possible, at least for this year and very likely next year and, and potentially the year after that, maybe forever. Um, people have argued to me that like, this actually will continue forever. Um, I'm not sure. Um, all right. I, I see the argument, rather, and I think it's very potential. Um, but, you know, but probabilities. Um, that right now, during this period, where the capacity for storage greatly exceeds the amount of data used, meaning um, while the data onboarding is, is continuing, that means that the block reward can be um, shared with these data DAOs. And so that means that important commons that are governing really critical data sets can get funded by the crypto network itself, that can get funded by Filecoin itself to bring the data online. And that is super powerful. So just think of, think back to those data sets that, that you were thinking about. Think of the communities that are gathering them. Think of the communities that are curing those, those data sets. Often they're tragically underfunded. So this might be a way to like leverage the crypto economy of Filecoin to get all of those groups funded um, in a super scalable way, uh, matching to the data and the use of that data around it. So a lot of this will probably get better as the on-chain primitives improve, so um, as things like the FEM ship and so on. So yeah, really looking forward to this. And I will leave here because I think I'm already way over time. So thank you very much and see you again soon.